Welcome to the Jerusalem Lights Podcast with Rabbi Chaim Richman, whose goal is Torah for everyone. I'm your co-host, Jim Long. And now, Rabbi Chaim Richman. Hey, shalom, Jim. Shalom. Wait, let me just extend my hand across hey, this table and, yeah. sh- and shalom aleichem. This yeah. is so cool. You can, if you listen, you can hear the hands clasping one another there. Yeah, there, there we go. Yes, okay. Because? Because here you are in our humble studio in Jerusalem, Israel. Anipo. I am Atapo, atab, atabai, in the house. And it's so wonderful to have you here. Of course, I gave you your traditional lunch yes. of parva hot dog and, mm-hmm. and uh, a type of lentil soup. Yes. Yeah. Your favorite. It's fully cooked. Yes. Please. And I didn't pour it down your throat like Asa <laughs> because you're a tikkun for Asa. Amen. That is so cool. Amen. I'm so happy that you're here with us and uh, so happy. First of all, I thank you so much. And I thank, I thank your good wife, Carol, for allowing you to take off time and come and spend time with us and for participating in the wedding of our beloved baby son yesterday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was just so exciting. I'm still in the clouds. It was such a beautiful, beautiful wedding. So, so wonderful. Such a blessing. Yeah. I'm very, very honored. Thankful to us. Very honored to have been on hand. It was, a. I have agree with you completely as did most of the people that were there. It was a lovely, exciting uh, experience. It was, uh, it's such a, a prayer and such a, you know, a, um, yeah, it's such a prayer to Hashem that we find our soulmates and that we make a go of it. And that it's just such, such an incredible demonstration of his orchestration of Hashka Pratit, of this divine providence of how he brings people together. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's so, it's so precious and so beautiful how he brings souls together. And it's, it's, it's a breathtaking process, you know? Yeah. And um, they were such a beautiful couple and everybody was talking about how they just looked so beautiful together. And it was really just an, an, an amazing atmosphere. Yeah. And, uh, and there's an extra measure of all the things that go along with uh, the wedding when it's here in, in Eretz Israel in the land. I just you I I think there's a you know not to d- diminish you know other Jewish weddings, but right. this it's uh, it always seems extra special because Shlomo, your son, could have easily have just gone off to America and God made, forbid, God made his life, and he has decided to stay. And this here. week in the land of Israel, the Torah portion is Shalach, which About. is the the portion in which everything goes south because of a lack of appreciation, a fear, a a um a misunderstanding of what Eretz Israel is all about, and so I like to look at this also as a tikkun. Do you, do you think that the, our listeners are going to hear those cats screaming outside? I, I hope not. At our undisclosed location, I I, uh, I I I can hear them, but I hope hopefully they'll. All right, so maybe they won't know what we're talking about. Okay. Yes, there is, it's rather distracting to hear those cats, but there's always something going on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, the backstory of, of, of a wedding and a couple coming together is their upbringing and their education and their, their own prayer to find each other. And, you know, it's, this is so, it's so intense. The sages say that, that uh, it's the main, the main preoccupation of Hashem is bringing couples together. And for him, it's like the splitting of the sea. Yeah. A very, a very esoteric teaching. What, what does that mean exactly? It's not hard for, for Hashem to split the sea. We'll get back to that, but in any event, um, you know, there's a there's this thing that we talk about all the time, and it's called coincidence, right? And we don't believe in it, right? We don't believe in coincidence. It's that's not a Torah concept because everything is part of this incredible fabric of Hashem's um, absolute providence over every aspect of creation. Fabric is the right word to use. We spoke up at this, you know, Purim time, the beautiful idea that in Hebrew, mikre, which is translated as happenstance or coincidence or random, right, is the same letters as rikma, which means a tapestry, right? How when you look at something up close, like you're right up against it, like all you see is this weave, this thread, like I, I see this one little detail. What does that have to do with anything, right? When you isolate it, that's all I see. But when you step back a little further, go back a few feet, and then you see the whole panorama, then you see that it's no longer a mikre, it's no longer one isolated incident, but it's a rikma, it's a fabulous tapestry of everything. 
But there's another really, really beautiful idea that I, that I want to uh, tell you, right? And that is, I, I heard this beautiful, beautiful definition of what um, coincidence really means in Torah terminology. And that is that a coincidence is when Hashem does something anonymously, <laughs> which is such a beautiful definition because that's actually the definition of Megillat Esther, isn't mm-hmm. it? The scroll of Esther, Hashem's name is not mentioned there. So, so, so Mikre, like when you look at something and you think that stuff just happens and it's good stuff and it's like unbelievable how this happened. Well, Hashem doesn't have to sign his name to everything because it's all Hashem. So this the story is the most unbelievable story in the world. And if I if I wouldn't know that it was true, I wouldn't believe it. And everybody that I've told the story to just is like their mouth drops drops open, right? But what's the story? So Shlomo married this wonderful girl named Michal, right? So for like seven or eight years, once a year, at least once a year, but especially once a year on the anniversary of the of the passing of my beloved father-in-law, he should rest in peace, right? Zechel of Racha. So the whole family goes up to his to his grave, to his tomb, right. um, in a very very special cemetery. We go there on the anniversary of his passing, and that's the custom. And we say special prayers there for his elevation, and and we meet there, right? So we're going there for many many years. So the cemetery is changing; they're adding. And it's filling up and, and it's a new section. We don't remember always exactly, you know, how to find it because it's nondescript and they, they all look the same. So, so we're looking and looking. And then we, we realized a few years ago, there's a landmark that we can always remember how to find my father-in-law's uh, tomb because near it, right near it, with nothing in between, there's another grave, which is a kind of um, unusual. It's not typical. It has a, a different kind of shape and a different kind of color. And uh, so we always remember because it stood out. And, um, you know, that's how we remember how to find him because it's near this, this other grave, which is, you know, was kind of something to remember. And this is going on for years and years. And now this time, so we all go as a family and uh, my new daughter-in-law, it was, it's before the wedding, but she's, she's also coming, you know, she's part of the family now and she goes with us and she sees that grave and she says, hey, that's my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you, you showed me the picture, but it's it, just it's, unbelievable. I, In other know, words, all those long nights, yeah, out it's, there, it, they, they had something to talk about. So right, there, yeah. it's just every single one of us who heard mm-hmm. the story said there is so no question about it that w- what we call they made the shidduch, yeah. meaning the two of them got together. They should rest in peace, my father-in-law and her grandmother, mm-hmm. and they had what to talk about. Yeah. And they said, "Hey, wait a minute, how about our children?" It's it's just so spectacular, yeah. and you have to you have to see the picture. You show me the picture to appreciate how remarkably different this headstone is. It right. looks it looks almost like a random outcropping sitting on top of right. a kever. Right. So it's yeah. a different kind of style. Yeah. Point. My point being, that's a sham. Hashem's signature on everything, and it's like that with everything, really. And uh, it's a it's like a a divine signal. And so it was it's, it's so beautiful. Anyway, like I said, I haven't come down yet because it was um, so beautiful. And uh, also we had a, a great honor that, you know, there are different stages to the Jewish wedding. As you know, there's the, there's the um, actual act of, of um, the marriage, which is the ring, you know, and then there's the blessings and there's the, there are, there's the reading of the ketubah. And then the, the actual, you know, statement of the groom to the to the bride and the and the giving of the ring has to be witnessed by two witnesses you know yeah. and there's an idea of finding people to of course all these things you know members of the family and friends and 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 great people are honored to come up and take their part you know say their blessing or do their thing and one of the most important functions is the two witnesses and they have to be people that are very very upstanding because everything is dependent on them like the the kashrut as it were of the of the marriage is depends on these witnesses who who watch you know with the ring and everything like that. So we were honored that one of our witnesses was the great Jonathan Pollard, Amen. Yeah. who was um, who actually sat in prison for thirty five years for helping Israel. And those people that are not so familiar with the story should familiarize themselves because there is a lot of hearsay, and then there is a true backstory of the discoveries that he made uh, while working in naval intelligence of how vital information that was 
crucial for Israel's existence was deliberately being withheld from Israel. And it was just an unbelievable story. And he suffered very greatly. And then his dear wife, who was so dedicated only for freeing him and bringing him home to Israel, she passed away yeah. right. uh, very, very recently, several months ago. And um, what, what a wonderful experience that was for the youth, you know, for like my grandchildren who learned about him in school, like a modern Jewish hero who sacrificed his life really for Israel. So he came to our wedding and he was a witness for Shlomo. What an incredibly inspiring experience. And the most, the most inspiring thing of all is like when he's in a room, like he fills up the room with hope. Yeah, yeah. I was quite, I was quite gratified to see the younger people in the crowd come up to him and ask for, you know, obviously they would ask for, but some ask for blessings. Right. And of course, through the whole thing, he, he was, you know, he's, he's trying to eat. <laughs> he can't he, walk down the street without people running over to him yeah. and just shaking his hand and saying, can I, can I just thank you? Yeah. Can I just thank you? Yeah. And it wasn't phased a bit. He was, he was quite, he was never taught. He was never too tired during the, the course of our celebration to talk to people and very the, gracious very and gracious. very patient with every single person who not only wanted a selfie with him, which I happen to know he really can't stand, and every single person who wanted just to, you know, just to be able to thank him, but also with people who came over and sat down and wanted to tell them their whole theory of existence mm -hmm. and, all their, and all their screenplays and all the yeah. things that they wanted. And he just sat very patiently, but what a wonderful experience that was um, and all together. And so thank you so much for being part of that with us, Jim. And, and um, I just want to share a couple of thoughts. And, and, and I wanted to give my son a blessing, you know, before the wedding. And we're all sitting together. And uh, there's so, so momentous. And there's so many momentous moments in the whole, the whole day preparing and everything. So I mentioned this idea, you know, it, it says about loving Hashem in Deuteronomy 6. And you shall love Hashem, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And loving Hashem is the only thing in all the Torah which requires us to involve every aspect of us, heart, soul, and might, right? Right. So, so I, I was saying, you know, like, what, what does this mean exactly? Like, how do you love your wife if you're loving Hashem with all your heart, soul, and might? What does that even mean? I think it's part of, the, it's part of it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The revelation is that Hashem is in everything, but, and every true love in the world is an aspect of loving Hashem. Yeah. But it's, it's even deeper than that. So that's the first level. The first level is like understanding that every level of reality and every level of reality that we are, that is precious to us and that, and that is part of our life, what we're feeling, what we're loving, what we're understanding, what's being beamed to us is the Hashem in it because that's all there is. That's the secret of Hashem's name that he brings forth all of existence at every moment, right? Yeah, you, you know, you mentioned the tapestry, and and uh, not to sound too glib, uh, we all know the saying, uh, you know, somebody sees the big picture. Well, God literally sees the big picture. He he because he he created the, the the tapestry, and I think that what you're approaching another way for us to uh, find peace in, in our relationship with Hashem and with, with our friends and with humanity is to finally get to the point where we see his big picture. Right. And we understand, like you just said, you understand, Oh, this tapestry is so big, but if I can, if I can look at it and, and in a way that every piece has a purpose and every stitch has a purpose, then I think we, we achieve that kind of uh, grace and acceptance of, of everything he sends to us. Right. You know, so, you know, um, in um, the Torah, there's a verse that says, Al -tifnu el -ha -elilim, which means do not turn to false gods, do not turn to idols, right? So you know that the Zohar is the mystical interpretation, the mystical depth of the of the secret of what everything means, right? So yeah. Rabbi Shimon in the Zohar says a strange thing that's hard to understand at first glance. He gives an interpretation of the verse that says, do not turn to idols, right? Do not commit idolatry. And he says, what does this mean? Don't look at other women. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so unbelievable. What is the secret that he's saying? It's the, it's the deepest thing in the world because what he's really saying is, you have Hashem with you in the house. Why are you looking at some at some idol? God is in your wife. Your wife is a manifestation of godliness, the Shekhinah, Amen. in your home. Yeah. 
That's why he told Abraham, he said, listen to Sarah. Right. Those words, Rabbi, changed my life. Wow. Because when I read that, I read it uh, for decades and it never hit me until uh, I, maybe it was because I finally uh, was with the woman that was supposed to, I was supposed to really be with. I mean, and that uh, uh, I began to actually listen to my wife, uh, the lovely Miss Carol, and see that, you know, that she was she was the key to my relationship with us and and, wow. and understanding wow. that. Wow. Well, you just said the deepest thing in the world. I hope everyone is listening. Your wife is the key to your relationship with Hashem. That is so true. It is. Yeah. That is so true, Jim. What are we? What are we without our without our holy wives? We're nothing. We don't deserve anything. Yeah. The, the, the woman is really, she brings everything to the man. She yeah. really does. That's the secret of the talit, you know, that the custom in, 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 in our in our congregation is that you know meaning in the, the Ashkenazi custom right is that a married man puts on the large talit right until yeah. you're married you wear like the small talit under your shirt and then mm -hmm. a married man puts on the, the large talit because the the talit is one of the uh, commandments that is an allusion to the outer lights you know there's an inner light like when you eat matzah there's an inner light but when you there are certain mitzvot like living in Eretz Israel like put like like going into a sukkah that the light surrounds you because you go into it completely mm -hmm. and the and the marriage covenant is also considered a, an outer light and the wife if a man merits that his wife is really his soulmate she brings him his completion she completes him she brings him his surrounding lights yeah that's why this is beautiful custom like even the slightest custom in israel is the deepest torah the beautiful mm -hmm. custom is that the father-in-law should buy the groom his first talit because he's giving him the whole set. Yeah. Because he's giving him his daughter, which uh, which is bringing this fellow his surrounding light, his crown, his halo, which is alluded to by the talit. Yeah. Your son has wrapped the talit around Michal, and she has taken the the fringe. Right. She's taken hold of it and she's right. pulling it around right. her. And they're both covered together. That's yeah. when he he made the blessing over the talit, and then he made Shechianu. Yeah, the blessing, uh, the special, for, the blessing for a special occasion, thanking Hashem for keeping us alive and sustaining us and bringing us to this day, which He made not only on His new relationship on the marriage, but on the talit itself, yeah. and then they enwrap themselves in the talit. So our listeners will forgive us that this week uh, we're not going to have a new Torah portion video because Shlomo is our videographer and editor and cameraman. He's like one of the major components of Jerusalem life. So we'll give him a, a week off. This is his, his, yeah. his week of the Shavu Brachot. Shavu Brachot, the, the, the seven blessings. So I just want to say one more word about Shlomo, who is, who is an amazing person. And um, how did Jonathan Pollard come to our wedding? I don't, I don't really know him. And it was such an unbelievable honor. And the way that it worked out was because you know, as we were studying the, the laws of marriage and preparing um, as a rabbi and his son studying, you know, we're learning that the witnesses at the wedding ceremony have to be very good people. They have to be very upstanding people. And so, and so uh, Shlomo, like the rabbi who married them said, you know, has a, such a high level of awareness. He, he wanted to find like the greatest person to be his Amen. to be his uh, witness and uh and this is like a tzaddik of the generation yeah. jonathan pollard anyway what an amazing experience and uh Amen. looking forward to to great lights in the world that the two of them should bring into the world god willing so then i come home for the wedding and i am reminded of this verse the verse is a difficult verse, and it is in the scroll of Kohelet, otherwise known as Ecclesiastes. And it reads as follows. If I can find it. Yes, here we go. Chapter 7 and verse 2 in Ecclesiastes reads, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For that is the end of all man, and the living should take it to heart. I get home from the wedding and I find out that a very, very dear friend has passed away. And um, I don't even know if it's been, uh, if it's been announced yet by, by his family. So I'm not gonna mention him by name and 
his interment will be on Friday. Um, a very dear Noahide, a wonderful, wonderful lover of Hashem and, and serious student of Torah. And uh, that's, that's very hard. And uh, what does this verse mean? It means that if a person has a choice to go to a, a house of mourning or a house of rejoicing, better to go to the house of mourning because right. it, keeps you st- it keeps you straight. It keeps you straight. And if this is, that is to say, I mean, yesterday I did both, but that is to say, if you have one choice, because this is more, more it's going to have more impact in a positive way. I left out of the story about this wonderful wedding, the most beautiful wedding I ever saw, is that I am in my year of mourning for my dad. He should rest right. in peace. So therefore, my rejoicing at the wedding was also muted in a, in a kind of a very unusual dynamic in that I was not allowed by Torah law to be rejoicing as I normally would. In, in fact, normally I would not be going to any wedding this year at all as, as, a, as a mourner for my father. But because it was my my son, and he, my son would have been very unhappy if I wasn't at his wedding. I was allowed to go, but I wasn't able to dance like with everyone together. I danced myself, just with my son alone. So that was kind of like um, muted, like I say, and tinged by this uh, by by this aspect as well, you know. And that is the whole secret of what I'm trying to say right there, is that um, rather than be in denial of the stuff of life, you know. We need to work on internalizing the truth about the human condition. And the truth about the human condition is that it, every day is a blessing. Every moment is a blessing. There are very, very joyous moments in our lives. And it's, it's on loan. And that's what I mean by internalizing that truth and not being in denial. Not in a morbid, morose mm-hmm. way, but understanding, wow. And the, the saying in Yiddish is like, as long as you're alive, live. Yeah. Amen. At every moment that we're alive, we have to realize that yeah. this is an unbelievable privilege to be alive, but it's not ours. It doesn't belong to me. When you look in the Torah, the, the patriarchs often uh, make very serious decisions based on the fact that someone in the family just died. Right. You have, uh, didn't this happen to Isaac? Uh, when, when Isaac decided to give the blessing to the sons, it was because... His, uh, his brother uh, had just passed away, I believe. I'm sorry, it was Avraham. Right. Avraham had passed away, and he had uh, he, he, sud- he suddenly felt his own limitations. Right. Like, Wait a minute. Life does not go on forever. And in fact, it was that very same death, the death of Avraham, his father, is the reason that Esau responded in the negative way that he right. did. Because he was like, what do I need the birthright for? Right. If, if a tzaddik like Abraham could die, and you know, yeah. he had that totally screwed up idea of life and death yeah. and in this world and the next, because he said, wow, if there's such a thing as death in the world that even Abraham dies, so like, I don't need this. I mean, here was, here was a man who, you know, excuse the expression, rape, robbed, and pillaged is right. what Esau did that day. And yet he still respected his grandfather, Abraham Avinu. Right. So there's another verse in Ecclesiastes, right? That says that says um, a good name is better than fine oil, and the day of death better than the day of birth. That's right. the verse, right? A good name is better than fine oil, and the day of death. And death. So that is like whoa. <laughs> it's like okay, it's putting it right out there, right? The first verse that I quoted from was chapter seven, verse twenty, which is it's better to go to a house of mourning. But this other verse, verse is saying like, what? Well, hello, the day of death is better than the day of birth. So the midrash explains this verse in a very unique way. The Midrash says, picture this. There's a, a, lot, a lot of people at the dock, a lot of people at the dock, and there's a ship going out. So they're all there like in finery, like, and they're making a big party, like, and, they're, and they are sending the ship off and they're doing bon voyage, right? And the ship is going off and uh, they're all there, right? To greet it. In the distance, Coming into the harbor is a ship that just sailed around the world and nobody knew when to expect it and there's nobody there to greet it and there's no fanfare yeah. and nobody's making a big deal. So the Midrash says, this scene is ridiculous and it should be the opposite. Right. Everybody should be there greeting the ship that came in and a good ending is the main thing, right? In Hebrew, we say, sof tov hakol tov. If the ending is good, then everything is good. So the ship that finished, and you know that they made it safe, and you know that they did their mission, and everybody, everything's accounted for, that's the reason to celebrate. 
But the truth is the shift that's going out now, who knows what's going to happen? We have no idea if, it, if it's going to make it or not. So that's the idea that Midrash is saying that that verse is telling us that a good ending, a righteous ending is something to celebrate, something, to something, honor. something to honor. Yeah. Exactly. So um, all this is kind of like intertwined, you know, this, 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 this whole idea, not again, not in any way being morose, but it's all, it's all kind of in one fabric, again, in one fabric, it's not because it's not Mikra, it's not random, it is a tapestry, life and death is one is one tapestry. And, and, uh, I mean, there are moments like this that are so emotional and that are so, and that grab you so much and that are so, and that are so significant, like the wedding of a child. No wonder our sages say that at a child's wedding, all the forebears are there, mm -hmm. all the souls of all the departed. I know, I know that my son went and brought invitations to the to the graves of his grandfathers. Wow. You know, and this, because there's such an idea that, 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 you know, everyone is together, you know, in one form or another, and nobody's really gone. And so it's all kind of like intertwined. And, I, and I'll tell you, just one more thought about that from this week's Torah portion that's being read in the diaspora and that we read here in Israel last year, last week. But again, I, I hope that you're, you're hearing what I'm saying, because it's all good. It's all so, it's all so positive and it's all so beautiful. You know, again, it, you know, I started this by saying, wow, I, I came home, was confronted by this very sad news. And Jim, the reason that we make the blessing when someone passes away, what is the blessing that we make? Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, the true judge. True judge. Yeah. Dayan HaEmet. Do you know why we make that blessing? What does that mean? Because we can never understand or justify or even make peace with anyone's loss, even under the most uh, peaceful circumstances and even when it was to an, an, an ease of of their suffering because it's death to us it's death and so the idea is dayan ha'emet when we bless hashem that he's the true judge it means that only he knows the reckoning only he knows the cheshbon the calculation and 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 he can't be influenced and he can't be bought off and not only that but he has no malice he has no agenda and therefore his judgment is absolutely and impeccably true. Yeah. Even and it's and we make that blessing at a time of bereavement when we are feeling so emptied out and bereft by this loss, because that's what we reflect on that this is Hashem's judgment and therefore it, it and therefore it's good. But I, so I'm saying I, I came home and I received this news and I, and 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 I'm processing this together just as at the wedding in the moment of my rejoicing. I'm still processing and dealing with my father's death and dancing nonetheless with my son because this is, he deserves that. And of course we break the glass at the wedding because we don't have the Holy Temple. And therefore what is all of this anyway when Hashem is left out and he doesn't have a house and nobody seems to care, yeah. right? And so like uh, one rabbi said, like, why do we keep breaking glasses at these weddings? Like, let's just build the temple. Like enough, enough broken enough glasses, the, already, yeah. right? Enough of the broken glass. Right. <laughs> but I want to say in last week's Torah portion, there's a, a beautiful, beautiful thought that last week on Shabbat, I was reading the portion and this suddenly came to me. Like, I feel like Hashem gave this to me. I feel like he literally gave me this thought in my ear. And that is that in Baalotcha, in chapter nine, we have beginning on beginning with verse fifteen this beautiful idea about the divine signs that would accompany the Israelites' travels. You know that there's a cloud covering the tabernacle, and then in the evening there's like fire, right? Yeah. So in the morning there's like a pillar of cloud, and at night there's like a fire. And so this is always going on that the cloud is covering it in the daytime, and the fire is covering it at night, and then when it's time to move, right? And this is such an unbelievable verse. According to the word of Hashem, it's translated in, in English, but in Hebrew, it's actually according to the mouth of Hashem. That's how the children of Israel would encamp, right? According to the mouth of Hashem, they would encamp. All the days that the cloud would rest, they would encamp. And when the cloud lingered on, many days the children of Israel would maintain the charge of Hashem and would not journey. Sometimes the cloud would be on the tabernacle for a number of days. According to the word of Hashem, would they encamp? And according to the word of Hashem, would they journey? And sometimes the cloud would remain from evening until morning, and the cloud would be lifted in the morning. They would journey for a day or in a night or for two days or a month or a year, right? And all of a sudden, I realize what Hashem is telling me in this verse. 
this is a metaphor of life. Right. It's all, we have this life, you know, and it's all, the journey is all according to Hashem's word coming from his mouth. Sometimes it's a day or two, sometimes a week, sometimes a year. In other words, meaning, I don't know how long this life is. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. But this is Hashem's decision. And when it's time to move, we move. When it's time to camp again, when it's time to go, we go. And, it's, and, and this is so perfect, this description of sometimes it's a day or two or a week or a month or a year. You know what? It's in Hashem's hands. Our journey here, this is exactly what we're doing in this world. This scene of the tabernacle moving through the desert is our life moving according to Hashem's word. Yeah. Keeping their trust. I think it takes people sometimes a lifetime to achieve that. I've been stumbling around for, you know, decades. But Jimmy, isn't that the meaning of life? Isn't that like our job? That is really our life's work is to get to know Hashem. Yeah. To get to know him, to get to feel comfortable with him, to get to trust him. And yeah, sometimes it can take our whole life and, and the, even until the last minute. But, yeah. but the idea is this is what we're doing here. We can't all walk the same path. Somebody else can't live our lives for us. And uh, I find that that's something that uh, it takes us finally some maturity to be able to impart that to our kids. There is such an upheaval and everybody's looking for Hashem. Yeah. And uh, I never felt it as strongly before in my life as I'm feeling it right now. You know, Jim, there are people that are listening to us, the people that are watching the videos from all over the world, literally from... Trinidad and Tobago and European countries and all over the world, people are coming to Hashem. People are studying Torah. People are leaving behind false doctrines. And I got an email from someone very precious to me. And um, I'm not going to mention the country that she's in because I'm so, I'm so concerned for her security that I'm not going to give too many details. I haven't asked her permission, so I'm not going to I'm not going to mention too much. But this is someone who is so so dedicated to Torah study and to Hashem at great personal risk, and it comes to all the Zoom classes, always on the front page, right? I always see their picture, right? And uh, this person writes to me that um, they access their access to the world is blocked. YouTube and Facebook are all forbidden to them. And so, and so uh, this person, I'm not even saying the gender, uses VPN to connect and writes, maybe the rabbi cannot imagine the horrible censorship. Torah study is not easy for us, blank. I cherish every moment. I must immediately focus on all messages about Israel, Jewish people, and Torah when I am getting through. This is just so unbelievable. So unbelievable. This is still going on today in certain places that the governments, it's not North Korea, by the way, the government where this person lives does not allow them access to the internet. And, and at great personal risk, because if they find out this person also has an important job, this person is, is, spends all their time that they're able to uh, studying Torah. It's just incredible what, what people are going through. And this is an example of a soul that is really, really precious and, 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 and willing to risk it all for the truth. Yeah. Amen. That's startling. Uh, it, it's, yeah. What a privilege for me. This is the greatest thing that I, the greatest moment that I, of my life. There's nothing more I could ask at all than the, than the privilege of being able to help a person come closer to Hashem. That's what Jerusalem Lights is all about. So I thank Hashem that, that he gives me the strength to do this. Goodness, it's really, it's really, really amazing. So, Baalotcha was the Parsha in um, Israel last week and in the diaspora this week. And there is, it's a slice of life. It's like, a, it's like a slice of this incredible generation of the desert, right? The generation of the desert, the generation of knowledge, they're called. I was at um, an event lately and someone was speaking, a rabbi was speaking, a dear friend of mine, and he was speaking about this generation, right? And he was saying, he was saying things that did not find favor in my eyes. He was saying that they were a very sinful generation, that they were terrible sinners. And I didn't want to show disrespect or dishonor him. So I didn't say a word, but afterwards I said to him privately, how could you say that? And I showed him other sources at the Midrash that say that they were 
a very, very great generation, but very, very greatly flawed. And there's no question about it. They, they did sin and that Hashem did not forgive them because they died in the desert after this week's Torah portion, this week of the land of Israel, Parshat Shalach, when the people were convinced um, that the land was not good and they bought this merchandise that the spies were selling of mass hysteria and giving up hope. But the point is this, this is a generation of tremendous, tremendous con- self-contradiction. And one of the things that we've been learning in our Sunday Zoom classes, because we finished the entire book of 1 Samuel, and by the way, I pointed out in our Zoom class that 1 and 2 Samuel are not, is not a Jewish concept. The book of Samuel was divided later in history by non-Jews, by, by non-Jewish uh, sources that they arbitrarily divided. And by the way, at a place that doesn't make any sense at all, they arbitrarily divided Samuel into one and two, but mm-hmm. that, is not the, uh, that is not the Jewish concept. Anyway, so we finished what is known as, as Samuel one, and we're learning, with, it's so precious, this class, because we're learning, I don't even know if, how long it is already. Is it two years? I lose track of time. We're going very, very slowly, and we're revealing so much depth of every word in this book about, and our goal is to really bind ourselves to the soul of David, to understand the emergence of King David because he's the soul of Mashiach. And so we all pine for that revelation in the world. But as we learned so much about Samuel and about his mother, Hannah and everything, and of course about Saul. So we learned about King Saul, right? And King Saul and so many people that come to the Zoom class have said to me, they're so grateful for the class for one reason alone, because it changed their whole idea of who King Saul was. Because apparently in the church world, people got a very, very negative impression of King Saul. Oh, he was a bad king, right? Yeah. So, but what I've been pointing out consistently is that King Saul was a great, great man, that he, his humility was unthinkable. He was so self-effacing. He was so great. But yes, he was also terribly flawed, so much so that Hashem ripped the kingdom away from him and gave it to David. And it's complicated. It's very complicated who he was and why he had a failure when it came to listening to Hashem's commandment of destroying Amalek. And so much goes into it about his midot and about who he was. But what I've been pointing, and but, but the point is we never show him any shred of dishonor because he was a great, great man, King Saul, and he paved the way for the monarchy of David. But the point is, he was great and he was greatly flawed. And so what we're, what we're emphasizing is that a person can be great. A person can even be a tzaddik and also fail in some ways, because that's the beauty of being a human being. We're not angels. Hashem didn't give the Torah to the angels. He doesn't expect us to be angels. And the fact is that we're human but a human being can rise to greatness and at the same time can also have a lot of issues. And that was King Saul. He was a great man who was greatly flawed. And that is a good way of describing this generation because this generation, and this is why I was telling my friend, this rabbi, that don't say bad things about this generation because Chazal say, our sages say, this, first of all, this generation will come back in the resurrection and they will come into Eretz Israel. Moshe himself will bring his generation into the land of Israel, right? But why did they drop dead? That's Hashem's words, not mine, in the desert. Why, would he, why did he get so angry that he decreed this death on them? Because they rejected the, the land of Israel. They spoke Lashon Hara. They freaked out. But don't forget that this is the generation that ate the manna, drank the water from the well of Miriam. This required a tremendous degree of holiness and integrity just to be able to handle that diet because it was a jarring, wrenching spiritual diet that, that showed exactly what you're made of. And so they received the Torah at Sinai. They heard Hashem's voice. They, they experienced all the miracles of, of Egypt. And yet, plop, they stayed in the desert. They could not go on because they misunderstood a lot of things. So yes, there's, and this is the thing about them. This is what I wanted to say that everybody has to understand. And I'm saying this now here in Parshat Balotcha because it's such, an, it's such a full picture of who these people were because you have here the complainers and the rabble and they were complaining about the taste of the manna and all, all this stuff, right? The thing is, they were so great, but they were so flawed, like, like I'm saying about King Saul. So on the one hand, they were giants of the spirit. The, 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 the sages say that during those 40 years that they were wandering, even after the decree of the spies, you know that they, their clothes stayed clean and pressed by the clouds of glory. God was like 
ensconcing them with like this, with like in like this, like they were like in an incubator of divine light and love, right? Their feet never swelled up. They never had to relieve themselves for 40 years in the desert because the manna was a totally spiritual diet and made no waste products, right? So they were like the living end and yet they failed miserably. So, so the point is, you always have to say both things. Don't say that they were sinners, but they were. But they had they had very great points as well. I say all this because, again, in in this week's Torah portion, you see this so much so much going on. Right on the one hand, you had this the greatest people in the world are the people who asked for Pesach Sheni, the second Passover in chapter nine. They come to Moshe and they say, "Why are we being left out of Passover? It's so important." Like, and they because they had that sincere desire to do the Passover, even though it was a month later. Hashem said to Hashem, Moshe says, I have no idea what you're talking about. I never heard of such a thing. Wait here and I'll go to ask. And Hashem says, I was, I was waiting for you to ask me. That's such a great thing. Yes, you have a second, a second chance. So what? Hashem gives a second chance. But yet, but he, even for that, he's waiting for you to ask for it, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you have the other extreme, right, of these people who are the complainers, the people took to seeking complaints, that is such an unbelievable thing. They, they took the seeking complaints, right? And then you have the people in verse four in chapter 11, the rabble that was among them cultivated a craving. This is one of the most loaded, misunderstood, amazing expressions in the whole Torah. You know what it means? I'll tell you what it means. We have to open your heart in the deepest way because it's stupendous what it means is that they look at themselves, right? And they see... They're not, they're not defecating. They're not going to the bathroom at all. And they're like, this is not normal. The Midrash actually says, they said to each other, is there such a thing as bringing, putting in and putting in and putting in and not putting out? This is what the Midrash says. What's going to happen to us? We're going to explode. So they're looking at themselves as like, and instead of saying, wow, we are on a different wavelength now. We are God's children and he is feeding us from his table. They're like, no, this doesn't make sense, does not compute, does not fit in with the laws of physics. But it, but it would have been okay. But then it says, they, it says that they cultivated a craving. That's the Erev Rav. But then they influenced the children of Israel. So the children of Israel also wept once more. And they said, who will feed us meat? As if they had free meat in Egypt, right? We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt free of charge, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. That's, that's actually a great secret as well. The sages say, you think if they didn't even give them bricks that they gave them free food? Believe me, they didn't give them free food if they didn't, if they didn't give them straw for bricks. What it means is that they, they're saying, we remember when we were free of the yoke of heaven. We were free of responsibility. We were free. We didn't have all these commandments that Hashem gave us, right? But what does it mean that they cultivated a, cra a craving? It's that they wanted to want. In other words, they were like, living this angelic life, they didn't feel the ta'ava, they didn't feel the lustful, like wanton, um, you know, what is, what is it called, garrulous? They didn't, they didn't feel like the, the hunger, you know, like the, the, the craving, you know. Mm -hmm. And they looked at themselves and they said, how come we're not craving anything? Like, so they cultivated a craving, meaning that they, they basically like, were trying to ignite their own yetzahara, like, wow, I want to be a regular guy. I want to look at things I shouldn't look at. I want to, I want stimulation. I want to, I want to feel something juices flowing. I want to want mm -hmm. because I don't want, that can't be good. That can't be human. That can't be normal, but it was. So, so that, that's another side of that generation. In other words, they had, they had tremendous, tremendous spiritual heights of, of, and the, and the Talmud says there'll never be another generation on that level. They were so high. They were so pristine. The life that they lived was so close to Hashem. But on the other hand, again, bang, they, the spies came back and, and that was that. They spoke against the land of Israel, un unforgivable. But the point is that somewhere in between is a tremendous lesson in what it means to be a human being. Yeah. Well, it also takes us back to the garden. Because that's that thing that you're talking about that they craved, uh, and in fact, what, what are the what are the graves called? The, 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 the right. graves of craving. Of, right. That's what took them back into the to the earth, because that craving you're talking about was their their earth their earthiness that they were supposed to be free of, 
And that was something that was that was first experienced in Gan Eden. Right. Is and it's it's it, talking about it's the world of imagination. They they weren't free of that yet. They weren't free of because it, it's 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 a kind of idolatry. Be, that, that you you think that you need the God was saying I'm freeing you of all physical wants. But isn't it if, if it's an idolatry? Isn't it an, a, 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 an like an inflation an idolatry? of the self but it but yeah. but but more specifically of my like gluttony like yeah. i want to be like ah, i want to be like it's they a celebration have... of my raw base humanity you, know, you called the you you rightly called them you, you know they were living like like angels they weren't and and god finally said you know if it's that's what you crave right. i'll send you right back to the ground you right know? again under underscoring the idea that these were not evil people right but it's just so much to handle at once. And I got to tell you, I feel this is why I brought this up, because my, my very dear friend, you know, was saying to this crowd, you know, like, oh, these people. And I said, please don't say that. So I feel like I've always because I've done a lot of learning and a lot of research on these people. And I and I understand what they went through. But I feel that uh, I've always been like I've always endeavored throughout the years to be uh, to be to defend the position of the spies. The spies is, is very bizarre, right? This week's Torah portion in the land of Israel is Parshat Shalach that begins in chapter 13 of the book of Numbers. And it's the mission of the spies. And they go out. And at the time that they went out, they were, they were tzaddikim, right? The, verse three says, Moshe sent them forth from the wilderness of Paran at Hashem's command. They were all distinguished men, the art scroll says, heads of the children of Israel, Kulam Anashim, so the sages say it means that they were all at that time, they were all great men. They were all God-fearing it, men, but something it, happened. It names them. Yes. Which is, is a kind of honor in the Torah. Yeah. Yes, except that there's also like a drasha, like our sages, our sages find allusions in their names to their flaws. Ah. But the thing is, they go out and they, at the time they went out, they, they were good. And then they see, they see what they see, which they misunderstood because Hashem was making all of these people busy burying their dead so that they wouldn't pay attention to the spies and all of these things, right? And um, what happens is they, they fail, they fail dismally. They have this tremendous cosmic freak out and they come back and they say terrible, terrible, terrible things, lies about the land of Israel. They have this freak out and uh, there are different ways of understanding it. One way of understanding it is very, very negative. And that is like that they, there, and there are, there are positions that are sages say, because you know how in the, the Torah has different levels of meaning, you know that, and they're all true at the same time, which is one of the incredibly impossible to describe experiences of Torah study, the more that you understand it, and the more that you, that you learn and that you meet with people who have an understanding of Torah, the more you understand that it all, it's all true at the same time, different levels of meaning. So on the one hand, these people were petty, they were some say they were motivated by like, well, if we go into the land, who's going to be the chief rabbi? Who's going to be in charge? You know, like I'm going to forfeit my tribal head as the head of my group, my clan, and all sorts of all sorts of things like that. And on the other hand, there's an opinion, and many opinions, that they were so holy that they actually could not bear the thoughts of forfeiting the experience, the relationship that they were experiencing with Hashem in the desert, because they didn't have to grow food. They didn't have to be involved in this world. They were, they were lifted aloft by these clouds of glory. Like I say, they were attached by an umbilical cord. They were in an incubator that ate the manna. From the day that they went into the land, the manna stopped. They had to plant. They had to grow. Regular people, which is, of course, the Tikkun of Gan Eden, as you know. But the point is, according to that other opinion, like it's like that they just had this terrible misunderstanding about what this world is, about what Eretz Israel is, that it's here, that it's now, that it's real. And they wanted to go on living this life, which is not the real Torah existence. The real Torah existence is living according. And we say that every single time we're together, that it's about this world. So anyway, so like I said, I always felt myself to be a supporter more of the opinion that these were great men, that they, because it's all true, like I said, that they were great men, but that they, you know, they misunderstood. And what a shame, because, you know, they, they just misunderstood what holiness is. And I didn't want to subscribe so much to the opinion, you know, that they're just losers and yeah, they're sinners. Uh, for years now, I've been, I've been every parsha Shalak, like I've been trying to point out like this incredible dichotomy and talking about like how, like, what a shame that they missed the boat and they didn't understand that the, you know, the main thing is this world. 
However, this year, I feel like maybe being a little bit more critical as well after I said all that, I'm losing my patience. And this year, I feel, you know what? I spent enough time being Mr. Nice Guy and judging them favorably. Let's talk a little bit about what this is because they did something that was so horrible that it literally changed Hashem's mind, even though, as I've said this so many times, even though when, when the people of Israel rallied around the golden calf and not, with all that ridiculous nonsense, Hashem was like, okay, 3,000 people approximately died in a plague, but the next day is like business as usual. He forgave them, and they're going to go on into the promised land. But now with this, and you know, I've said, I've said year after year, this shows us, it's right here in black and white, I'm not making it up, that, that Hashem, the honor of the land of Israel was more important to him than his own honor because he was willing to forgive idolatry, the golden calf, but not the Shon Hara against the land of Israel. Right. And the reason that this is so important and so apropos and, and never gets old is because this is the number one sin of our generation in terms of Israel's own sin, and that is keeping a distance from, disavowing, um, and um, finding the land of Israel to be a liability. And unfortunately, with all that's going on, with wokeness and with fakeness and with the pressure of the media and with anti-Semitism and with everything else, this mentality of turning against the land of Israel is, is still present in the world. Certainly it's present in the non-Jewish world where it's just like, you know, how, how can I count the ways that I hate Israel? You know, yeah. it just is so much uh, horrible uh, swill being directed against Israel lies all the time all the time called all sorts of fancy things that were against colonialism, even though America, of course, is the very image of colonialism. But we won't talk about that because it's not convenient and people just laugh at you if you talk about the fact that America is based on basically the genocide of a people. Well, but anyway, I, I got to add this to the people that are because I've, I've noticed that they're using that word colonialism a lot. The people that say that uh, generally are also saying that america is bad because it started with colonies so it's i mean you can i get that and i saw that and i'm going to i'm going to re read something here to you about that the only the only thing is that uh this is not about a colonialism you can't colonize what's yours you can't <laughs> again all, all of these stories about judaizing jerusalem yeah. How do you Judaize? This, this is like, and, and people that are otherwise seem to be intelligent, but they but they just want to be so much part of what's going on. They talk about how we're trying to Judaize Jerusalem. If Jerusalem was never the capital of any other people, never an Arab capital, always a Jewish capital, King David's capital, you know, 3000 years ago, how, how do you Judaize Jerusalem? How come nobody talks about the French making Paris into a French city? How could you Judaize something like that? But anyway, I'm very, very disturbed about one thing that I wanted to talk to you about. And again, again, I, I, this is like raw for me every, every time we read this Torah portion because it's so real today and uh, it's so horrific, you know, and, and you see Hashem's heart, as it were, that he made this decree against the entire assembly, ex with the exception of Yehoshua ben Nun, Joshua and Kalev, who were not part of those 10, everyone uh, was to perish uh, in the desert. And then there's this group that, you know, that they, in, in chapter 14 and, and uh, verse 40, there's a group like they awoke early in the morning and they said, let's go. We're sorry. <laughs> right? Right? We're sorry. And they woke early in the morning and they ascended toward the mountain saying, we're ready and we shall ascend to the place of which Hashem has spoken for. We have sinned. And Moshe said, what are you talking about? Why do you transgress the word of Hashem? It's not going to succeed. He said, don't go. He's not with you. And so they, ascend, they ascended anyway, defiant, defiantly. And the Amalekite and Canaanite came and pounded them. So that means like when Hashem wanted them to go, they didn't want to go. When they wanted to go, Hashem didn't want them to go. 
So first of all, I think that's a lesson for everybody today is that if Hashem wants you to come now, you should come because this is the place of Jewish existence and the place that has relevance for Jewish history forever and the place where the Jews can change the world and fix the world. And the thing is, you know, uh, this is going on all the time, this, this kind of um, speaking against the land. And I think that the duty of every person, I know, that, Jim, I don't want to speak for you. You're sitting right here. Not only are we, on, are we online together, but you're sitting right across the table from me here in Jerusalem. Tell the people, is it not the duty of non-Jews who bind themselves to Israel, who believe in Hashem and who love the Torah to wake up the Jewish people and tell them, we love you, but please go home. I've spoken in synagogues when I've been asked the question, an honest question, when they say, what can we do to help Noahides? Sometimes I tell them bluntly in the kindest way possible, I say, buy a one-way ticket to Eretz Israel. It's, it's rare to find a Noahide who has converted, who does not convert and make Aliyah. Right. You should... know that I have several dear students here in the land that started out as Noahides and have converted and are now living here. Exactly. In fact, I, they were they were at the wedding. At the wedding yesterday. Yes, I, I remember that vividly. You know, it was years ago we had a we had a uh, a channel that we tried uh, to put up on Roku, and it was called the Menorah Channel. Carol and I developed it and put it together and launched it. And I think we were a little ahead of the curve because we could never, as in the parlance of, you know, the industry, we never got it monetized, but we tried. And I remember still the conversation I had with a young rabbi from Chicago that called me and he wanted to know if he could put. Uh, I remember this story. This is I, I unbelievable. He said, you know, can I, could I put a program on the Menorah Channel? And I said, you live in Chicago. He said, yeah. I said, have you seen our masthead shining light on the people, the history? and the land of Israel. And he goes, yeah, yeah. And I said, it doesn't say the Torah shall come forth from Chicago. Ouch. Rabbi. So, and I even felt a little twinge when I said that to him, because I thought it sounded unkind, but it's the truth. Right. It's the truth. And I have Jewish friends that don't. How did me. he react to that? He said, he said that he said the same thing. He said, ouch. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, and the thing is, as you pointed out, and those of us who, who have, I think loved our, our Jewish brothers and sisters enough to say, you know, I mean, I, I know. Yes, I love you all, but there is no future yeah. outside the land of Israel. And that's what this Torah portion teaches us in every Torah portion. And again, you know, and I don't usually come, come across like this so strong because I, I'm, I have a lot of compassion for people, uh, that, uh, for everyone. And I don't want to ever not speak compassionately to people, but I think that times are changing they have changed. I think, I think that we're in for very dark times. I'm about to talk about that. And I do love my Jewish brethren. I love everyone. And I think that they need to know that this is not rehearsal anymore. It's like Galut, the, the exile, is an aspect of death, mm -hmm. and it is an aspect of punishment. And thus, if you don't have to stay, why stay? And if you are waiting for something miraculous, a sign, a wonder, well, we already had that, yeah. right? And so it, 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 it's like, I'm not putting words in Hashem's mouth. He himself says that this is the place that I brought you for in order to fulfill my commandments. And so- And over 300 uh, commandments require you to be in the land of, of Israel, to be in Israel. Years ago, in, when I lived in Dallas, Texas, I was talking to a rabbi friend and I thought I, I was close enough to him at the point where I said to him, well, how come you haven't made Aliyah yet? Jim, he said, you know, a rabbi is like the captain of the ship, and he's the last one off the ship. And I said, Rabbi, but you're not telling people the ship is sinking. Jim, that is the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. That is so true. And that's the whole thing, because the fact is that what, and this is, again, I'm going to just say it. What started out as being clearly an aspect of exile and a punishment became so successful and comfortable that it has now been kind of like enshrined as a, as a um, testimonial, as a monument to Jewish um, ability to survive and flourish and thrive and make the best and then surpass and then, and then achieve. But it wasn't supposed to be that way. 
so there are there are vast academies and there are and there are civil rights and you can work for the government and wear a kippah and you can get kosher food anywhere and all that is so wonderful but but that lulls one to sleep and complacency into thinking that this is a normal existence now, a lot of Jewish people that are going to be listening to me are going to be saying, yes, but nothing is perfect in the land of Israel either. You've got so many problems. It's not a Torah government. You've got anti this and it's, it's really bad. And I always have only one answer to that, which is just come here and do something about it. Yeah, That's all. Let's just come here and do something about it. Amen. So, so we're going to get such email, Rabbi. Uh, you never know. <laughs> um, so, but the, the, but I thought of all of this because here in this week of here in our uh, Torah reading in the land of Israel, we're reading about this this um, seminal event. You know, this watershed event of the spies, which has just impacted history so much because it's such a recurring nightmare. Right, and it's one. It's one of the sins. Just like, just like there are three. There, there, are, there is, there is the eating from the tree of knowledge. There is, there is the sale of Joseph. There is the golden calf, and there is the sin of the spies that somehow manages to creep back into, uh, into the fabric of our existence every every time. You know, it's never, it's never gone. Right. Anyway, so in this week, right, I read this article in the Times of Israel. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Someone sent this to me, dear friend, sent this to me. I didn't see it. Um, and it's about what's going on in none other than Massachusetts. Hello. Right? Massachusetts, there is something going on. There are pro-Palestinian groups that have joined together in some kind of progressive activist group and it's called the Mapping Project. And you know what they're doing? They are making a map of where all the Jews are. Listen carefully. Jewish arts groups, schools, synagogues, they're all part of a network according to this, this pro-Palestinian group, and they're alleged to be responsible for wide-ranging societal harms. So this map, is mapping all the Jewish organizations in Massachusetts. And its goal is to, is to, and I quote, to map institutional support for the colonization of Palestine. So what do you have in this, in this map? Jewish arts groups, Jewish high schools, Jewish newspaper, a synagogue network, a major Jewish philanthropy who, who's direct, whose funds are directed to mental health, homelessness prevention, and refugee resettlements, but yet... These are all on this dense interactive map, map of, quote, Zionist leaders and powerhouse NGOs that are basically, their, their, their crime is that they are normalizing Israel, okay? This is what their crime is. But it goes on to say that, it, that what their goal, these mapping people, mapping the Jews in Massachusetts, right, is to reveal how support for Zionist causes is a nexus point for various, quote, other harms in society, ranging from gentrification to the prison industrial complex to ab ableism. I don't even know what that is. Ableism? Yeah. The point is, Jewish groups are pretty upset, and they say that it is little more than an attempt to catalog and intimidate area Jews the unbelievable thing about all of this is that it include this mapping project includes the addresses of these Jewish affiliated organizations, and it spans across the aisle from right wing organizations like the Zionist Organization of America to left wing organizations like J Street, putting them all together, saying that they're all bad religious organizations, private foundations headed by Jews. They're all bad academic research centers like Harvard Center for Jewish Studies. They're all bad because they are all somehow making Israel look like it should exist. So I get this, and I say, I say to my friend, I can't believe that this is going on. And she says to me, it's, this is her quote. She says, it's been going on all over the U.S., not with Jews, but with judges and people who voted for Trump. Pathetic. And the DOG does nothing about it because they are just as guilty. This is how they left. This is how the left found out where Tucker and Kavanaugh lived. My thing is, this description, and I understand that this is a problem. That basically, 
nobody's allowed to think anything anymore or be anything that is not yeah. what is what you're supposed to be, right? But my thing is, when you read this description, I didn't, okay, that's all true. And they did find out where Tucker and Kavanaugh live in. I know, and I know that they do it with judges that they don't like and people who voted for Trump, but they're not doing it with Christians per se. They're not doing it with Bangladesh per se. They're only doing it with Jews. They've always only done it with Jews. And basically my thing is that when I read this, Parshat Shalach or not Parshat Shalach, this, this idea of this is called, what is it called again? It's called the mapping project, right? This is a description of the early 30s exactly. in Germany. That's exactly what I thought. And I'm not that. exaggerating. I'm not, no. I'm not, you know, you know, you know when Pollard, right? Our tzaddik Pollard, who was at who honored us at our wedding, right? Jimmy sat at the head table with him. Yeah. When he first went to his superiors in naval in naval intelligence, and he said, I don't understand. There's information here that Iraq is producing chemical gas uh, and and uh, you you specifically not telling Israel you know what he was told you know what he was told he was told by his superior in the in the United States Navy Jews worry too much about gas oh my god okay oh that's that is a hide of insensitivity okay so my and goodness. and so that that's what made him realize that he has to approach Israel directly in any event the point is this is Germany in the 30s. They say it can't happen. They say it won't happen. Blah, blah, blah. This is so chilling, right? Jim, I was born in Massachusetts by some cosmic wrinkle. My soul touched down in Massachusetts, but I'm here already 42 years. It's going pretty good so far. Yeah. And the point is, um, you know, a person has a tremendous affinity for the place where they were born, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the greatest ironies, of course, is that a lot of Jewish people in Massachusetts are, are very left wing. Yeah. And they don't, never thought that this could happen to them because they don't even like Israel because they feel uh, that Israel is an, an albatross around their neck. It's a liability because it's so un, unpopular right. to support Israel that they're just afraid of being branded. And what's the irony? That's what's happening now. Why? Because they're Jews, yeah. not because they support Israel. That's what it's all about. And so what, what an incredible insight in Parsha Shalach. I'm not a doomsday prophet. I'm not, God forbid, saying, I'm saying, it's just a news item. Turn the page if you want, or think deeply about what it really might mean for our world today. And what an innocuous name it has. Right. It sounds, the mapping project. Right. The mapping is- project to find and pinpoint and mark with an X, the house of every Jew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this reminds me, you know, in ancient Egypt, I don't think... I was thinking about that, Midrash, yes. yes. When Amalek swept down into Egypt after Israel had left, and they were all in, in the desert now, and their first military campaign, of course, was against Amalek. Well, Amalek had gone into the archives of the Egyptian government, and they took that entire census list, and they rode off into the desert, and they caught up with them at night, and at the edges of the camp, they would read the names of the families off of the census list. And those who were in the fringe and who were, you know, as they say, the, the lesser or weaker, they said, uh, oh, listen, these people out there that are calling our names, they know, they know our family. They've got to be friendly. They've got, they, they, they were on this list of theirs and they're naming our cousins. So let's go see what it's all about. And of course, Amalek, slew them right there in the right. desert using those same those same census lists were used to execute innocent Jews right. in the desert. And or and or or maybe they didn't say maybe they like us, they know our names. Maybe it was a form of psychological warfare. Maybe it was torment. Maybe it was Big Brother. That's exactly maybe it was like right. who's out there that knows who we are. We know where you live. We're the mapping project. And you know what Amalek shares with these people, don't you? Amalek's goal was to wipe out any thought or any vestige that there was a God. And by and, and where did they start? They had to start with the, the people of Israel, because once they could wipe them out, right. then there would be no one to keep to keep the knowledge of Hashem. Right, alive. because without Israel in the world, there is no God. Right. That's what Hitler was all about, killing God. Jim Long, sitting here at my table in Jerusalem, what a tremendous pleasure and honor. Thank you for having so me. So happy that you're here. And uh, our listeners can look forward to a few more shows. You'll be here for a little while and we shall be recording together, which is so much uh, of a different experience, really. 
And again, just from I shouldn't keep saying it because I don't know when it's going to happen. And, uh, you know, Shlomo just got married, but he's working hard. So just give him a little time. We are going to be changing the format of this podcast into a video format. And we're looking forward to that very much as we are continuing to build our studio and get all of our equipment together, figure out what we're doing with our lives. And this week, we're not going to have a new Torah portion on Parshat Shalach, but we do have some up from previous years. There will be, for those listening that are part of our Zoom community, and everyone is invited to be of such Sunday, this coming Sunday, June 19th, the 20th of Sivan, and as well as Tuesday for our Mesilat Yisharim class this Sunday and Tuesday. We will be resuming our Zoom classes, God willing, and hope everyone has a wonderful, wonderful week full of every blessing. Shalom, shalom. Shalom.